I was brought up in the Northeast, although I haven't got a Northeast accent because I was born in Ipswich. Relegation, but Luton are going up, so that's fine. Uh, but I was brought up in the Northeast, and my grandma was from Hetney Hall. Hetney Hall, it's a canny place, mind. And it's between Durham and Sunderland. And she had a way of mixing up her words, mixing up her phrases. I won't do the Northeast accent, but here's a few of her phrases for you. He swept the rug under the carpet. She's burning the midnight oil at both ends. It's so cold last night, I had to throw another blanket on the fire. She's robbing Peter to pay the piper. He's up a tree without a paddle. Keep your ear to the grindstone. Sometimes you've got to stick your neck out on a limb. That was my grandma. Always mixing up her words, her phrases, her metaphors. I think at the end she did it deliberately because we always laughed. In our reading from John's Gospel, we've got two metaphors mixed together. One about sheep and one about fish. So my grandma's sort of phrase were fishing for sheep or were shepherding fish. Okay, because they're mixed together in the two stories we've just had from John's Gospel. The bit about fish and the bit about shepherds or sheep. And I think it's a wonderful, wonderful summary of what the church is about what the church's ministry should be about. To set the scene, we're after the resurrection. That's where we are, with the risen Jesus appearing to his disciples. But it's actually hard to set the time frame for this little encounter on the shore of Lake Galilee. We don't exactly know where it fits in the story. It's almost like a sort of epilogue, like a sort of additional ending to John's Gospel. If you cast your eyes just above the reading on 1090, if you've got your Bibles open, just above the end of chapter 20 sounds like the end of the story. It says in verse 30 of chapter 20, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. It sounds like an ending. I can always imagine John writing it, putting down his quill and going, whew, I finished it. I finished the work. I've told everybody all about Jesus, the one that I loved, the one that knew me, the one that I knew. Almost next day, perhaps, he came back and said, just a minute. I just want to emphasize a certain point. And this extra chapter is like an extra bit at the end of John's Gospel. And if you look at the very last verse of John's Gospel, look at chapter, verse 25 of chapter 21, it almost sounds like the ending again. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose the whole world would not have room for the books that, you, that would be written. John puts in this extra chapter. Why? Why would he do that? And I think it's to emphasize what he wanted the church to grasp. What he wanted the disciples to grasp and the church to grasp. It's almost like underlining what the church is about. It's almost sort of saying, right, you've heard what Jesus has done. Over to you guys is what he's saying. So we don't exactly know where the roller coaster time for those disciples They've been overwhelmed. Life's been throwing an awful lot at them. They've seen their Lord, their Savior, their teacher, the one that they loved, the one that they valued, nailed to a cross, beaten up by the Romans, dead and in a tomb. Heartbroken they were. And, th and then these stories start to leak out about Jesus has been seen. He keeps appearing all over the place. You know, Mary went to the tomb early on that morning, and the body wasn't there. Peter and John ran down and looked inside, and Jesus wasn't there. The tomb was empty, and the linen shroud was sort of folded up neatly and put in the corner. Always wonder about that bit. Read it again. See if you can understand why it says that. You know, the voice of trembling, could it be? Could it be that Jesus isn't dead? And then, of course, he starts appearing. You know, he appeared to the disciples in the room. He, Thomas wasn't there, so he came again to make sure that the door was locked. He still turned up. He breathed the Holy Spirit on them, and then he disappears. And then he pops up again. You can imagine their minds are racing. 
their minds are going, what do we do? Is it true? Is it really true? Perhaps it is. So this event that we've read is in the midst of all that's going on, all that sort of uncertainty, all that anticipation, all that fear, all that uncertainty. What do you do when you're overwhelmed? Do you go off on a long walk? Do you go and see a friend and have a cuppa? Do you go and read a book? Do you go and cry in the corner? Or are you strong and don't cry? What Peter did was went to do what he knew about. He had been a fisherman, so he said, I need chill space. I'm going to go fishing. And the rest of them said, okay, we'll come along with you as well. Some scholars have sort of had a bit of a go at the disciples about that. You know, had they given up on Jesus just going back to the old job? I don't think so. I just think they needed a bit of night stress reliever, a bit of fishing, because that's what they could do while they tried to process everything that was going on. And then we get two living parables. These are living parables, a bit in the sort of Old Testament sort of style of parable. If you read a lot of the prophets, they lived out parables in the Old Testament. And that's what we get here. We get two living parables about fish and about sheep. So the seven disciples are in a boat. You can imagine the lanterns hanging on the end, and they've been throwing their net out and pulling it in, throwing their net out, pulling it in, throwing their net out, pulling it in, and nothing's happened. The little circling net they use on Lake Galilee and chuck it and pull it. And ch- nothing's happened at all. Not a single fish in sight. Do you sometimes feel like that? Well, chuck it out again. Nothing's happening. Chuck it out again. Nothing's happening. Chuck it out again. Come on. Nothing's happening. Why? Because they were doing it without any expectation. They were doing it on their own. They were doing it by themselves. They were doing it in the dark. And suddenly, there's a voice. It's in the mist, in the fog. There's a voice that says, throw it on the other side. I didn't know this person. He sort of can't quite make him out. He's over there somewhere in the fog. So they obeyed. Not because they knew the guy. Maybe they were just so honed on getting some fish. I must catch something, a fisherman. Fishermen always want to get fish. You know the fisherman's stories, he always catch more than he really catches, obviously. So they cast the nets on the other side. And 153 fish. 153 fish. Maybe we'll come back to the number in a little while. And then the fog begins to lift, and John says, It's the Lord. And old Peter, you know, splashes in, feet first, and the rest row back to the shore, don't they? It's the Lord. By doing it with Christ in his way, they started to bear fruit. Or is that another metaphor I'm mixing? Probably is. It's a living parable, a post-resurrection fishing expedition. Reflects the very beginning of what Jesus called the disciples to do. Because what did he say? I'm going to make you fishers of men. So it's re-emphasizing where he started. It says, now... You're not going to do it with me. You're going to do it for me. Under my guidance, under my leadership, under the way that I want you to do it. But you're going to do it for me rather than with me. I always find it amazing. Someone bothered to count the fish. One, two, 153. What's all that about? I think, first of all, it could just be a large number. It's also a prime number. A perfect number. I don't think you can divide it by very much. If you can work out what to divide 153 by, anybody know? No, it doesn't. And there was a great that Jerome, a biblical scholar from 400 AD, said there were 153 different types of fish in the Sea of Tiberias, one of each. I'm not so sure about that one, but I quite like the idea. <laughs> Basically, it means a lot, a lot of fish, different sorts of fish. The overriding idea is the disciples doing it Christ's way for him will get a big catch. The church 
doing the fishing for Christ in his way will get a big catch. This is 2,000 years ago. Now in the church we have people from across the globe, all backgrounds, more than 153 different types of people, I'm sure, because everyone's unique. It's come true. This living parable has happened. But we're still missionaries today. We're still called to be those fishers of people. The number one task of the church is to go fishing. If you don't go fishing, you ain't going to catch any fish. Oh, that's a revolution, isn't it? You're not. Do it for Christ in Christ's way. That's the first story we get. The first picture of what the church is about. Then we get to the sheep bit. The sheep bit. Jesus is on the shore. You may notice he's already got more fish. He doesn't need us, actually, but he wants us to help. He doesn't need us because he's already got the fish. They're already being grilled, aren't they, for their last breakfast. But he wants us to help. He wants us to help. I'm sure Peter, very excited about seeing Jesus. You know, he's jumped in the boat. He's run to the shore, got all wet, splash, splash, splash. But I'm sure he's a little bit embarrassed about what happened. Because last time he saw Christ, he said, I don't know. Three times, I don't know. Don't know the man. Don't know the man. Not me. Not, not, I haven't got a northeast accent. Honestly, I haven't. It's not me. He's still probably wrestling with that guilt about what happened when he last saw Jesus. So Jesus, if you read the text, addresses him directly. Simon, son of Jonah, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Simon, son of Jonah, do you truly love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Three times Peter affirms his love, and three times he's charged by Jesus to take personal care of the flock, of Jesus' flock. And this triple action is to counteract those three denials, of course. Jesus is asking Peter if he will really be that disciple, that follower. That rock on which he's going to build the church, which he said Peter was going to be. It is alluding to the price of that. The price of that discipleship is love. The question we have to ask, do we truly love Jesus? Yeah. Do we truly love Jesus? Yeah. Do we truly love Jesus? Would you do anything for him? Would you? That's what Jesus was asking Peter. And it's the same question to us. Do we really, really, are we willing to go that far for Jesus? Are we willing to? And Jesus here asked Peter to fulfill all those duties of a shepherd. Pastoring, protecting, searching out the strays. Caring for the injured, protecting and providing the shelter. And he asked the same to us today. Are you willing, really willing, to go that extra mile? Do you love me enough to do that, is what he's saying. It's a beautiful two pictures of what the church should be. Fishing and shepherding. And Jesus is saying, over to you. Over to us as church today. Are we being shepherds? Are we protecting? Are we searching for the strays? Are we caring for the injured? Are we providing the shelter and much more? And are we being fishermen? Are we actually going fishing anywhere? If everyone here went fishing and caught one fish, one person, in the next year, the church would double. 
That's as simple, isn't it? Wow, need more chairs. Did it again, we need a bigger room. Or two services or something. The church cannot live past one generation without going fishing. If it doesn't go fishing, we ain't going to be here in another generation's time. Without evangelism, any church, the church, will die and wither. There'd be no new Christians coming through. It's quite a challenge for us. We've heard Christians are the most persecuted faith in the world. We still have freedom in the UK. We may be ridiculed, but we're not going to be chucked in prison for saying, I love Jesus. Yes, I really do. Yeah, I really do. John's gospel is very different to the ending of the other gospel. You know, Matthew's gospel. We all know the famous bit at the end of Matthew's gospel. What does it say? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded. We know the Great Commission. This is a different type of Great Commission. Under Jesus' authority, we go. With his authority, we go fishing. This week, where are you going to cast your net? Where are you going to put the net out? And it may come back empty. And you do it again. May come back empty. Don't give up. Listen to what Jesus is saying. He might be saying, don't cast it that side. Cast it over there. Most churches are actually quite good at shepherding. We're quite good at that. Quite good at caring for one another. We're not quite so good at fishing, I don't think. We're pretty good at feeding the lambs. We're pretty good at tending the sheep. We're pretty good at caring for one another. Looking for strays. Maybe we're not quite so good at that. I think most of us would love to see more people in church. More young people in our groups. More people come to use this building during the week. Here in this vacancy, as you look forward to when your new vicar arrives, perhaps it's time to assess your values and your way of being church, your contribution. Peter said, I'm going fishing. Maybe it's hard to ask yourselves, where are we fishing? Are we fishing in the right place? Are we listening to Jesus prompting? Jesus handed over to the disciples the role of fishing and shepherding. And he hands over to us. He says, over to you guys. It's been handed down from generation to generation. These two stories here, mixed metaphors. But let's agree that we'll fish for sheep and shepherd the fish. Let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for church. We thank you that through your Holy Spirit, you prompt us and guide us and inspire us and help us each day. Lord, forgive us where we don't listen to you, where we don't listen to your voice, when we leave you in the fog far away on the shore. Lord, help us to fish where you want us to fish. And help us to shepherd and care for the lambs that you give us. We thank for the privilege of being called church. And Lord, I do pray for Christ Church here at the moment, in this waiting time for the new vicar to arrive. Lord, for each person here, as they assess their love for you, as they assess what it means to be church. May they hear your voice. In Jesus' name. Amen.